Hey, hey, hey. Hello. How is everyone doing today? <laughs> I'm doing good. <laughs> Happy to be back. Awesome. Yeah. Back uh, All right. Well, we got an exciting topic going on today. <laughs> yes, we do. And I think this one came by request, so um, um, hopefully we'll be. Yeah, I think so. It's also sort of um, kind of just a a natural uh, next step from last week's topic when we talked about EQ. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I think well, so. before we get too far, I'll do the welcome for us. Please do. Um, welcome to QSC Tech Talk. <laughs> I'm Golden Preziato, audio engineer, house of worship specialist with QSC. And I'm here with Jason Fernandez, live Hello. sound training specialist with QSC. Super happy to be hanging out here with you today. Absolutely. And uh, always a good time. Yeah. Hello, and we'll be yeah. I'm joining. <laughs> oh. Oh yeah. I can get those chats up there and see who's yeah. coming in. Very yeah, cool. Comments. Everyone out there, please feel free to chat with us, comment, ask questions. Yep. Um, so what are we talking about today, Golden? Today we are learning about how a compressor works. Yes. and how to use it in a live sound application. That's right. Yeah. Are yes. we ready for it? I think so. I'm ready for <laughs> right. it. I'm ready right. to talk about it. I, I love yeah. this, especially, you know, yeah. after last week, I was talking about EQ, um, just kind of moving right on into compression. If you got, if you got your EQ kind of figured out, you can get the compressor mm -hmm. figured then out. Then you add your compression. You, yeah. are, you are a powerful behind the mixer. Yeah, exactly. Well, audio compression is one of the most powerful mixing tools. It's the essential element behind every good mix. Um, but to make your compressors work for your mix, you need to understand compression first. That's right. <laughs> so what is compression in music? Well, music compression is the process of reducing a signal's dynamic range. Mm -hmm. um, dynamic range is the difference between the mm -hmm. loudest and the quietest parts of your audio signal. For example, uh, in live sound, imagine a singer singing super softly and all of a sudden just belting it out at the top of their lungs on their mic. It can end up being distracting for the listener and the audience as they might struggle to hear the super soft part and then all of a sudden just be blown out of their seats with the belting and loud parts. Just blasted. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen people jump in their seats. It's pretty <laughs> funny. <laughs> Using your compressor actually fixes this mm -hmm. by attenuating or making less mm -hmm. the loudest parts of your signal and boosting the quieter parts. Yes. Yeah. Right. So com compression can be used to actually to accomplish, accomplish a myriad of wonderful color and textures in the recording studio. But today, we'll be talking about the use of compression in a live sound application. Yeah, the compressor um, is quite often referred to as sort of the glue of the mix. It's, it's oh, very I like that. Kind of just bringing everything together and, and making the mix cohesive and and kind of nice sounding and pleasing and every, make, makes everything fit right and kind of stay in its lane, if you yeah. know. Um, and, yeah. it, and it does that exactly the way you just described, Golden, by by taking the the natural dynamic range of a signal and compressing it. Hence the yeah. word in compressor. It, it's taking yeah. the loud parts and it's squishing them down. And so we're gonna we're gonna, gonna explore that in a little more detail. And then um, I've got my mixer set up like I usually do. And as Golden's walking us through the various controls, I'll actually kind of demonstrate them in real time. So yeah, we'll one little back and forth going here. Yeah, so to understand compression, it first helps to know what transients are. So um, Brad, go ahead up and bring up my transient slide. Lesson time. Lesson time, oh yeah, <laughs> gotta love examples. Pictures, kids love them. <laughs> okay, kids, ready? <laughs> Transients are the initial high energy moments of a certain, 
of a certain sound in your waveform. Now these bursts will give our brains a whole lot of information about the quality of a sound. And since transients are often louder than the rest of your waveforms, compressors will affect them considerably. For example, think of a nice cracking snare. I did this for you, Jason, since you're a drummer. <laughs> as, the, as the snare hits, there's an initial peak in your waveform, which is the yellow part. And then it tapers off slowly, and that's the blue part. The initial peak energy is your transient. In live sound, too much transient from the vocals or instruments, whatever it may be, will make those things pop out of the context of your mix. So um, we're gonna tame them by using our compressor. And let's go ahead and I'm gonna go to the next slide here. All right, okay, so I'm a sci-fi girl. Let me introduce you to the five main controls at the helm of your Starship compressor. <laughs> Once you understand what these controls do, you'll be able to operate any Starship compressor. So we have threshold, ratio, attack, release, and then the makeup gain. And those are the five main controls that we are gonna be looking at today. And let's go ahead and get uh, Jason's compressor up there. And uh, as I start explaining, we're gonna start with threshold. They say I have dropped out. Oh, am I still there? Oh, good, okay, I'm still there. Okay, I'm just gonna keep going along with it and we are gonna leave my slide up until Jason gets back online. So first we have threshold. The threshold sets the signal level where your compressor will start working. Threshold is measured in decibels. So any signal above your threshold dB will be compressed. When you set your threshold, you're deciding which part of your signal you want to reduce. So setting the threshold lower will apply more gain reduction and setting the threshold higher will affect only the most aggressive peaks and leave the rest untouched. And if you look over at my picture over here, you can see, I don't know, if, um, I don't think you guys, yeah, you can see my little mouse circling. That is the threshold right there. And you can see I have it set at 21.1 dB. And as the signal on my meter hits this point at 21.1 dB, it's going to start compressing. That is the threshold. And I think we almost have Jason back because I I'm, want him to I'm share. Here. I'm so yay. sorry. I have no idea yay, what happened. Yay, yay, <laughs> yay. Yeah, I'm back. How, how's so, it been doing? You good? I good? It's Here's going good. Students. We are ready Perfect. for you to show us the um, threshold, the threshold. Oh, slider yes. okay. on your mixer. Here so we we'll go. make him there big. Yeah, big. there we go. All right. Here it is. Yeah. Here's the compressor in my touch mix. This is the threshold slider. This one to the left here that says threshold. Um, and so I was I, telling them when you set the threshold lower, it applies uh -huh. more gain reduction like That's right. that. And then setting it higher will um, affect only the most aggressive peaks and leave the rest untouched. That's right. So, so and by higher and lower, we're sort of speaking in, in oppositions based on what the graph is gonna do. So a low setting like this, or, or high, uh, could be considered as a high setting, which is going to heavily compress, is gonna look like this. And if I talk into this, I have a secondary microphone set up running through this compressor. Um, you, you can't hear the audio from it because it doesn't matter through StreamYard, but uh, you can see at the top of the meter there, uh, that one in the middle that's red, 
That's yes. gain reduction meter. So as I'm speaking into this microphone with that threshold set where it is being extremely low on the graph, um, it is very heavily compressing uh, the signal coming through this, this microphone. Uh, and if I back it off, you should be able to see, here we go. Now it's just kind of, just kind of barely, barely compressing yep. as I speak. Yeah, it's, and if I go it's even just higher, getting the most aggressive transients. That's right. Yeah. So, and that's what you so want. You kind of want to just in to our just practical change. application. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was done. In you, our practical application for live sound, um, you're probably wondering where is the best point to set your threshold. Well, that actually depends on the amount of signal that's flowing through your preamp. So, um, if you have a good amount of signal flowing through your preamp, then your threshold will be set higher because it's gonna be hitting where that meter is, where you've set the meter to be jumping and it's jumping pretty strong. If you're not getting a lot of signal, then your threshold might be very low and still not hitting the compressor. So you, it, all, all to say it's important to make sure that you have that preamp gain set so that you're hitting unity at least. Absolutely, yeah, the, the yeah. preamp is step one. You know, you, yeah. you get a healthy signal level into the mixer before all these tools are going to be, work to their full effect. Yeah, exactly. So moving on to ratio, yes. this is the next control on this the helm of your Starship compressor. <laughs> ratio determines how much gain reduction your compressor applies when the signal goes above your threshold. So yes. The higher the first number of the ratio, for example, four to one, five to one, six to one, the more the gain is reduced. Absolutely. And, and, and the lower the first number in your ratio, like 1.5 to one or two to one, will give you a more gentle compression. And you might apply that to like the entire mix. While the higher first number will give you a more intense squashing effect. Right. And, uh, so let's talk about some practical application in live sound and where is the best point to set your threshold? And Jason, since you're a drummer, give us some feedback on drums. Where's a good drums. place? So to typically in an election application, um, you're going to want to be in the realm of usually like between three and five. Five is pretty aggressive, but usually um, I would start with a 2.5 and kind of see what I get. And then I usually end up somewhere between three and four, uh, unless I'm going for a very specific kind of crushed effect on my snare drum or something like that, then I'll go as high as maybe five. Um, but that's that's pretty aggressive. I usually don't do that. Um, but yeah, I'd say any like between three and four, three, 3.5 is typically where I'll end up, you know, when you're compressing um, either an entire drum set or if you're just applying compression to like a snare or a kick drum, that's about where you want to sit. Yep. And I found that in certain genres of music that may change. For example, jazz. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> you, you wouldn't apply a compressor to drums at all. That and I've tried to actually apply a compressor to a submix output and it just didn't sound right for jazz. No. jazz <laughs> part of jazz is the dynamics that the, the yeah. very, the width of the dynamics and then it gets really soft and gets really quiet and you kind of you kind of need that for the authenticity of that style yeah, yeah. so instead in jazz i've used a dca to control volume levels and that's the way i kind of get around that and smart keeping it in the mix yeah a good starting place for vocals is three to one mm -hmm. compression that's a great starting place if you have a super dynamic vocal a singer who's going to sing soft and then all of a sudden belt it super loud, you may want to set that um, threshold. I mean, the, the ratio, we're talking about ratio yes. to um, 4.1 or 5.1, depending on how much they're belting. Mm -hmm. And this is where you use your ear because the whole idea is to make sure the vocal is sitting in the mix. Yes. No matter how loud or soft it is, that's yeah. what you what you. Need that's what you need. Yeah, and that's sort of why it's referred to as the glue. Um, so it's, it's just kind of glue the whole mix together. So whatever element you're applying your compressor to, like you say, use your ears uh, and just kind of 
finesse it so that it, it is sitting nicely in the mix and it's it's exactly where it needs to be. It's, if it's a lead vocals, um, you kind of want it to, to be stand out a little bit because it's usually the focal point of the song, um, but you don't want it to be overpowering the rest of yeah. the symbol. Um, yeah. And a, yeah. since Ooh, we're talking- I like oh, that. That is just, that is so analogy. descriptive. It exactly yeah. describes it, yeah. Um, I also cool. um, apply- R Real apply quick, I just wanted to- Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, since, since we were just talking about vocals, just really quickly, um, the you know wherever you land on your your lead vocal compressor settings, if you have a backing vocalist or even multiple backup singers, um, a, a cool trick is to actually uh, apply a higher ratio to your backup se section. What that'll do is that'll allow you to actually kind of keep the the volume of that backup section a little lower. And but it'll still be present enough in the mix because it'll be compressed a little heavier than the main vocal. So it'll it'll kind of sit just beneath your main vocal. You'll still be able to hear it. It won't overshadow it in any way, but it'll still be very present in the mix. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I also apply a, a low ratio, uh, I'm sorry, 2.5 to one ratio or so to my broadcast output mix that's going to a live stream. And the idea is, is just to keep it so that people are not turning their volumes up and down, up and down, up and down on their phone. Yeah. Um, that helps it out a little bit. I don't limit a, a broadcast mix. I know many people do, but if it keeps hitting the limiter, that's um, that's a ratio 10 to one or higher. Yeah. And it just hits a brick wall and stops. <laughs> um, it really adversely affects the sound. So, so just real quick, um, to kind of give a little bit more context to that concept of, you know, getting into to limiting, um, I just kind of want to give a brief explanation of what the ratio is referring to. Um, what, yeah, that, yeah. what those numbers are actually talking about. So when you have your, your ratio, like, a, like a, right now I've got it at 2.5, let's give it a, an easy number, two, two to one ratio, uh, mm -hmm. means that for every, every one dB, that your signal crosses over your threshold, wherever your threshold is set, your compressor is going to compress that by two dB. Sorry, that's backwards. For, for every two dB, uh, you your signal goes over your threshold, it reduces it to one dB. So in a two to one ratio, it's basically kind of cutting it in half. Um, and if you extrapolate that, so if you get four dB over your threshold, then it's going to reduce it to two dB, okay? So it's still, your signal is still peaking. You're still getting it over the threshold. It's just smoothing it out and reducing it once it's over that level. And then if you kind of take that further, if you get higher and higher, like a three or a four to one ratio, now we're saying for every four dB that our signal is going over our threshold, it is taking that four dB and squishing it, compressing it to a single dB. So if you yeah. think about it in those terms, it's easy to kind of get an idea of, of, of why the compression gets more aggressive the higher that ratio is. And then when you're when you're at a 10 to 1 ratio, that's that's crushing, you know? So that's it's, crushing you're, getting, it. you're getting 10 dB over your threshold is being reduced to a single dB. I mean, that is so much compression that um, that moves into limiter territory because yep. at that ratio, at that high of a ratio, your, your signal isn't actually going to be able to breach your threshold at that point. So it is it is limiting your signal level to yet that threshold point. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. So, so next, next in, our in our compressor controls is the attack and release. Yes. And he sh he'll show you where those sliders are. Yep. Here's and our attack and release over here. Yeah. And these are two parts of the same range of control. Attack determines how fast the compressor reacts when the signal goes over the threshold. Yeah. And release determines how long it takes the compressor to stop compressing. And uh, really together they are the most crucial setting for to achieve a natural and musical sound. Yeah, that's so, it. So um, yeah, if you set the attack too fast and your, trans your transient will be absolutely crushed. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you want to um, be careful where you set the attack and release. If yeah, you can... set the release too fast, then you'll get an unnatural pumping effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way so, I usually think of attack is I kind of in my mind, and I, this 
is something I do. I'm not saying do this. I don't even know if this is correct, but with the way I think about it, and I the word I take the word attack almost literally. Um, and you can you can attach the attack to the word transient. It's kind of the same idea. So the 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 lower your attack, um, that means that the more of the actual attack of the initial signal you're going to get, um, or the, the right. more you're going to press that much of it. So if you if you ease off your attack a little bit, what it's doing is actually allowing the initial transient to kind of breathe through or bleed through, and then the compressor is going to be kind of latching on after your transient initially strikes um and yeah you if you if you think about it like that and if with a super hot fast attack time if you're if your compressor is digging in to the initial transient um it's going to distort whatever that sound is that that transient is very important for our brain to be able to distinguish what that sound is supposed to be yeah um, so compress that part of it too much um it's going to end up sounding really weird and yeah, and you're yeah. gonna lose the timbre of what that's supposed to be. Yeah, for example, on drums, you want to make sure you so set that, that attack, attack quite long mm -hmm. because you want to hear that initial transient, the snap yep. of of drums. And um, on piano, um, you want to allow that to hear the hammer mm -hmm. go down. And even on a keyboard, there's um, you, they have settings where you can hear the hammer um, simulated, but you want to hear that. So you have some a, a, a good measure of attack. Now on now, piano, piano, you want to make you sure, make sure you have a longer release, mm -hmm. or you'll hear a pumping effect. Mm -hmm. So, and it's I can't really give numbers. It's one yeah. of those things where you have to you have actually to listen it. for it. But yeah, one. One piece of advice that I think I, you know, we can relay is when you're setting your release time, pay attention to your gain reduction meter. Um, and again, depending on the instrument, but if you're dealing with like a voice or a, a piano, for instance, um, you know, as that singer is singing or as that piano is playing, you want the you want the compressor to completely. Do you want the gain reduction to completely reset in, in between? every time the the instance is happening so if it's a vocal part you know after every phrase or after every syllable depending on kind of what your the effect you're going for you want that that gain reduction meter to be pumping all the way back to zero before it, it starts applying more compression because what happens is if your release time is too long uh it's you're not ever the compressor is not ever going to let up uh, and and so right. you're, you're going to end up in this constant state of compression, and it's going to sound very unnatural. It's going to sound very very dark. So that's, yeah. that's again, you can't really give hard numbers to apply to that, but um, pay attention to the gain reduction meter and your and use your ears to kind of yeah. find the best spot for that release control. Yep, exactly. So last on our controls is the makeup gain. And Jason yes. will point to that for you. There's that. Um, uh huh. When you compress a signal, you're essentially lowering the overall volume of that signal. So makeup gain adds gain back to your compressed signal. Mm -hmm. And I don't tend to use this so much in the live sound application because I have you know a fader at my disposal. <laughs> but when I'm working in the studio, I use makeup gain quite a bit, and yeah. this allows me to um, a, B, an uncompressed signal and a compressed signal at the same volume level. Mm, so cool. pretty important. Yeah, pretty important in the studio. And that allows me to hear the difference if I'm actually doing something good to the sound or not. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and hey, if you run out of fader headroom, you can always use your makeup gain to makeup add more gain, gain if you need. It's yeah. an additional gain stage. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool trick. Um, yeah, if you if you need more more signal or you need to get more headroom, um, turn your compressor on. You know, set your your threshold so that it is not actually applying compression. If you, if you if you don't need the compression, and you, but you can use your gain dial to just give it more more gain in the signal chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, real quick, Jason, can you explain? how compression might be a bit dangerous in our loud monitor situation. Ooh, our loud yes. wedge monitor situation. Um, too, yeah, too much compression, uh, particularly in a, in a wedge monitor, um, can create what's known as compressor latch. 
So if you have a, a really aggressive compressor settings, you have a really low threshold and or a really high ratio, meaning that um, if, if I'm going to use the example of a vocalist again, you know, if you have a singer that has these are, are super aggressive compressor on, on the vocal tone. So when he's singing into that microphone or she's singing into that microphone, the compressor is just slamming it and, and it's very, very, very heavily compressing. As soon as they stop, as soon as they stop singing or the song stops, the compressor lets up and now all of a sudden, all of this gain floods back into that signal and you're going to end up yeah. with a feedback. And because there's so much gain in, in the microphone now and that the monitor is just going to create that feedback cycle and it happens very quickly and very obnoxiously and it's it's bad and <laughs> yeah not not a lot and of it, people understand that that is why it's happening and so it becomes this huge nightmare and this huge headache to try to figure out why the microphone keeps feeding back in between songs so, yeah when i have a monitor that's on the edge like that that's one of the things i go back to because a lot of uh, singers will change their level which changes that how much input is being pumped into the through the preamp. So I'll go back and check to make sure they're not hitting their compressor too hard if they're sitting on the edge. And sometimes just backing off the compressor solves the feedback problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, take, <laughs> yeah. Take the threshold back two or three dB and sometimes that's all you need. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brad, go ahead and bring up my next picture. The touch mix has such wonderful graphics because it actually shows yeah. what the compressor does to a wave flow. And you can see it, it, it just makes more sense. But this picture is what is on most every mixer and digital audio workstation out there. This is the graph that you're looking this at. Is like the industry standard accepted yes. compressor, which leaves yes. out some information. But now that you know, what these do, what these different controls do, you can see them on the graph or there's your ratio. You know what your ratio does now. You know what your attack does now. You know what your release does now. So now that you can, um, now that you know what those controls do, you can set them by using your ear and you're gonna learn how they react on the graph as you start using your ear to listen for it. And another thing is I totally encourage you guys to Run a, run a stereo track or whatever through your mixer and just practice using the controls and listen to what's going on because that will give you an idea of how you may want to use your compressor to affect your audio signal on individual instruments and so on. Yep. Use your ears and practice. Okay. You know, learning to use these tools, learning to mix is very similar to learning an instrument itself. You know, it takes... It yeah. takes time it takes practice it takes work you got to get in there you got to play with the controls and listen to what they do so that your brain kind of makes those associations and eventually you it just becomes natural like oh i have this problem i need to do this to my compressor yeah so if you're having trouble remembering all the controls just think of it this way the compressor is like your mother <laughs> the threshold is the level she asks you to turn down the music yeah. the ratio how much you turn, turn down, down the volume, volume after she shouts at you. <laughs> and the attack is how fast you react and the release, how fast you turn the volume back up as soon as she closes the door. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a good analogy. That's uh, yeah, when I saw that, somebody else posted that and I just, it, it totally resonated with me and I hope it resonates with somebody out there. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think almost well, it can is, relate to that one. Yeah. It's a great analogy. <laughs> yeah. Although these days, most kids are listening through headphones. So, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. That's, whatever. That's, that's okay. <laughs> Jason, you and I relate to that. <laughs> yes, 100%. Uh, so, before we go, I wanted to let you know really quick about a couple of Facebook groups we have. The Touch Mix user group is one of them. So if you own a Touch Mix or are interested in owning a Touch Mix, or even if you don't own one, but you find yourself mixing on one, this is an informative group and where you can talk and learn about everything Touch Mix. And the other Facebook group we have is hosted by QSC and myself. It's called Church Sound Training. And this group was actually created for Church Sound people and their volunteers but um, the audio concepts that are taught here are universal and applicable across the board. So 
it's important to add to your audio knowledge and understanding so that you can operate your QSC gear, your touch mix and speakers better. better. Absolutely. Yeah. They're fantastic groups. Um, a lot of knowledge in there. Uh, a lot of help, both from users and admins alike. So if you're not yeah. a member of either or both of those, I highly encourage you to give us a join. Give it an ad. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Well, it's been wonderful hanging out with you all today. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you got something out of this. Yeah, I hope you did. <laughs> Hopefully that was a nice little starter lesson on compression. Yes. There's lots yes. more of it. Hopefully that, that gives you enough to get going. If you if you have yeah. access to a compressor in, in, in any regard, whether it's in a DAW or on a mixer or on a touch mix, hopefully. Yeah. Um, jump jump in there and start playing with those controls and, and get yes. a feel for what it does. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us and we will see you next time. All right. Bye-bye.